Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending uh, tonight's presentation. This is a presentation by the oil and gas division here at the city of Aurora. We're going to be talking about uh, updating our oil and gas regulations uh, in city code. And I'm very excited to share with you tonight the um, opportunities that we have and, and what we've done so far and how you can be a part of providing input into this um, discussion. So I am uh, new to the city. In fact, this, the oil and gas division is new as well. So I'd like to just introduce myself briefly. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Moore. I'm the manager of the oil and gas division. Um, I have a Bachelor of Science in Geology. I'm a licensed professional geologist in Wyoming, and uh, I've got over 20 years of experience in the petroleum industry. Um, I've also been a resident of Aurora for 24 years. Um, so coming pretty much right out of college, I was here, and uh, this has been my home for a very long time, uh, as it is for many of you as well. I've been employed with the city since March 2nd, so not very long, just getting my feet wet, and um, we've accomplished quite a bit here in the last couple of months, and I'm excited to share that with you tonight. Uh, a little fun personal talk, I'm also an award-winning author, so I like to kind of stick out out there sometimes. So I want to start with the vision that I have established for the oil and gas division. This would be uh, in conjunction with the city's vision and mission statement, and that is that we steward access to the natural resources under our authority with integrity and respect for our citizens, businesses, and the environment. So the oil and gas division has responsibilities to uh, different stakeholders. The first of those is, of course, our citizens. And for our citizens, um, we want to make sure that our, our decisions that we make are in line with citizen expectations. We want to provide safety to the greatest extent possible uh, to all of our, our citizens and residents. And um, we want to also maximize revenue to the city on behalf of our taxpayers. For our businesses, uh, when you think about oil and gas minerals, Keep in mind that in Colorado and in the United States as a whole, that mineral rights are property rights. So local jurisdictions and states do not have authority to, to halt oil and gas development um, of valid mineral rights. So our primary responsibility to our businesses is to provide assistance for the permitting process, provide clear guidelines for our expectations of how they will operate, uh, and really establish that mindset for what our expectations are and the way we want our operators to operate uh, within the city of Aurora. For the environment, uh, a key thing is making sure that we understand how all the various stages of oil and gas operations do affect the environment, uh, and making sure that we avoid negative impacts to the greatest extent possible and minimize other impacts that are not avoidable. So the reason for the meeting tonight is we're discussing the update of our oil and gas regulations. So I'm going to provide a little bit of history here for why we're engaging in an update to the Aurora Municipal Code and what that's going to look like. So historically, the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission is the one that regulated oil and gas within Colorado, and local jurisdictions really didn't have much authority. Uh, several things changed last year with a Senate Bill 19-181. And it gave local authorities new jurisdiction, new authority, to do two primary things. The first was to approve locations of wells or the siting of where wells are going to be located within their boundaries, uh, and also to implement rules and regulations that might be more stringent than the state rules and regulations. The, um, the state body, the COGCC, they have to look at uh, what's appropriate for the entire state, which includes a variety of different types of landscape. Um, local jurisdictions are more focused on what's appropriate for them. So in some cases, uh, we may have regulations that are more stringent, and in fact, that's what we're, we're presenting tonight. Now, in response to the Senate Bill 181, <clears throat> uh, the city did a couple of things. They created the oil and gas division, um, and I'm again honored to be the first manager of the division here at the city. And they also crafted some new regulations and uh, what we call best management practices, or BMPs. I'll use that acronym quite a bit tonight, BMPs, best management practices. Uh, and they used those uh, in the negotiation of two operator agreements with two different companies that were agreed to by city council about a year ago, uh, last June and July. And so that's what's been done to date. Now, that leaves us in a place where there are some old rules and regulations that are part of the official Aurora Municipal Code, um, and those really are outdated. That's why the City Council uh, engaged in updating those processes or those regulations for the operator agreement. 
because the existing code is outdated. It does not reflect current industry standards and current industry best management practices. And the city council wanted to provide um, greater protection to our citizens and to the environment. Um, also, the current operators are using these operator agreements. Those are legal agreements. And so uh, neither the city nor the operator can change the terms of those agreements uh, unilaterally. So, for instance, if we were to update our regulations in the future, we can't always apply those uh, retroactively to the well drilled under the operator agreement. So um, because of these two situations, what I propose as I come into the oil and gas division is that we craft uh, a new document called the oil and gas manual. And we put all the rules and regulations related to oil and gas in that manual. And then we update the city code to refer to the manual. Now, this process is something that's been done by other departments. For example, Public Works has a, a roadway design, construction, and specification manual that includes all the technical uh, requirements and regulations related to, uh, to roadways. Other departments have similar manuals as well. So this is in line with other departments in the city of how they do it. Um, and it's what I feel would be best, um, and it's what our staff feels would be best here uh, at the city. Now, there's some advantages to the city of, of taking this route. Um, the first is it does provide some greater protection to our citizens and the environment because we are able to update the oil and gas manual uh, as needed on a regular basis and include uh, new BMPs, new regulations as they become appropriate. It also standardizes all of our future operators and well sites to the then current BMPs. Finally, it reduces staff time and cost, which of course is a direct um, help to taxpayers here in Aurora. And we can uh, update this manual, the oil and gas manual, by promulgating new rules after a review by uh, a couple of groups here at the city. So we've engaged uh, a number of stakeholders in this process so far, and there are more to come. And uh, I'm going to tell you what we've done so far. The first thing here is that we collected, as I said, the best management practices and regulations from the operator agreement. And those became the base of the oil and gas manual. I would say at least 95%, maybe more, of the rules and regulations that you would find in this oil and gas manual came from the operator agreement. So on the whole, we're taking what's been already established a city council in negotiation, and we're, we're codifying those in a new format. We also, though, went back to different departments here in the city, the planning department, Aurora Water, Public Works, and said, hey, it's been a year since these operator agreements were agreed to, so would you please review these BMPs and decide if uh, maybe we should have some updates to those things. And in some cases, we did have some updates uh, to the BMPs that were provided by the internal department. I also looked at um, BMPs from other jurisdictions. Now, I want to tell you that our rules and regulations are not going to be a carbon copy of another jurisdiction. We're not going to look like Well County. We're not going to look like Broomfield. Um, our rules and regulations will be what's most appropriate for our citizens here in Aurora. That's our focus, is what's appropriate for our citizens and our environment here in Aurora. However, there have been a few things that I have uh, observed from other jurisdictions but I felt like it would make good sense for us. Um, to give you a, an easy example, um, in our operator agreements, there's a requirement on the, um, for inspections that the city provide 48 hours notice uh, in order to access a operator's location. I felt like that we might, in some cases, want uh, quicker access than that. And so um, I've actually changed that, updated that timing so that we provide reasonable notice, but not necessarily require 48 hours notice. That's an example of a BMP that I took from Broomfield and said, hey, I think their language is, actually makes more sense for us here at Aurora. Um, and so we've updated our rules and regulations in some cases based on other jurisdictions. Uh, we've also updated um, some things based on expected rule changes from the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. So uh, as you, you may be aware that after the Senate Bill 181 last year, which uh, provided a very large change in the focus for the CAGCC. They've engaged in a rulemaking process uh, and a mission change process update, really. And so because of that, they have some new rules that have been established. They have a number of other rules that are still in draft form, and they're working through those uh, in the next couple of months. So we've been, say, 
uh, involved with that. We're actually a party to those rulemaking hearings um, and make sure that we are aware of the direction that they're going. Um, and so we've included all those things that we, we can already. Um, all the state regulatory bodies are, in some cases, making constant adjustments and updates to their rules and regulations. So um, we will always be aware of what those changes are and we'll make changes to our oil and gas manual in the future um, as appropriate based on changes at the state level. And then finally, just last night, um, I spoke with the Oil and Gas Advisory Committee here at the city and received some great feedback from them on the uh, Oil and Gas Manual. If you don't know, the Oil and Gas Advisory Committee is a committee established by the City Council. Uh, it's made up of members of the public, uh, service owners, and also folks from industry, the petroleum industry. Uh, and they get together every other month and they discuss various topics related to uh, oil and gas development here in the city. They get an update of status, permitting status from staff, um, and they've provided some great feedback both to me uh, and also to city council. So what's remaining? Um, we have a 60-day public comment period, which we are entering in now. It will continue through August 23rd. So we've got more than a month left in the public comment period. Uh, there are two town halls tonight and one again on July 28th, which we'll be able to present this information and receive feedback from the public. Um, once the public comment period is done, then we will have a final review of all those suggested changes at, from the public by the staff and our city attorneys and then we'll create a final version of the, of the document. Um, that will then go through an internal uh, process of review at the city through several different committees, the Planning and Zoning, Planning and Economic uh, Development Committee, Planning and Zoning Commission, and finally City Council to approve the ordinance, which will actually legally update our code. Uh, I've got a timeline here, and obviously the, the, the words are very small. I don't expect you to um, to look at this in detail, but I'm a visual person and I just want to give you a visual demonstration of where we are here in the process. And the red star in the middle is, is where we are this week. Um, so we're about halfway through the process so far. We've, we've had all these things that have happened that I just described and, and yet still more to come. So we're about halfway through the process. All right, now let me talk a little bit more specifically about the oil and gas manual itself. Um, how it's laid out and then we're going to go through a slide of each of these uh, sections and detail to give you some more perspective on how we are, um, uh, the types of BMPs that we're including in our own gas manual. So section one's introduction, that's just the basic establishing authority for us to uh, uh, craft these rules and regulations. Section two is the oil and gas permit application process. Um, and uh, that process really just delineates step by step the process that the operators would use to go through um, the permitting application process from beginning to end. Um, we've had that previously, but we've made some adjustments to it based on COGCC uh, upcoming rules changes, and um, it's very detailed and let the operators know hopefully exactly what to expect in terms of the application process here at the city. Section three is safety and security. I put this first because um, whatever operators we have that come into the city, I want that to be the first thing that they see, that whatever they do, our expectation is that they're going to do that um, with safety in mind and with security of the location. When I say safety, I mean safety for everyone involved. I mean safety for um, the public that may live or work or, or drive around where the locations are. Uh, I mean safety for the workers that are on location working for the oil and gas company. Um, and security as well. We want to make sure that the location is secure at all times and um, that we have appropriate regulations in place uh, to, to make sure that, um, you know, someone that's not authorized cannot access that location and, and cause problems. Section four of the oil and gas manual is titled Protection of Water Quality. As a geologist, a licensed geologist, I feel that protection of water quality is probably the most important thing that we can protect, and here's why. Um, it's because that to remediate water, especially groundwater in an aquifer, is, is time consuming and expensive and, and somewhat difficult. Um, it can be done, but it does take uh, significant effort to update or to um, uh, remediate water in an aquifer. And so I've included this section next because I want our operators to know that 
um, the decisions that we make as a city, that's going to be a primary thing, a uh, primary driver is protection of water quality. Section 5 is protection of air quality. That's the next most important thing. We make sure that the things, the emissions, um, well, I should say that we try to limit the emissions from the oil and gas operations as much as possible. And then also, um, you know, we have monitoring in place and that we're aware of what the air quality is around these oil and gas locations. Section 6 is protection of surface quality. So this is everything related to the surface, such as uh, landscaping and, um, you know, weed control and, and everything else. So we'll get into the details on that here in a few slides. And Section 7 is uh, general oil and gas permit requirements. That's everything that did not fit into one of the other uh, sections on protection of water, air, or surface. Now, these first seven sections, these are related to oil and gas wells and uh, the areas around those, which we call locations, oil and gas locations. And then, beginning in Section 31 through 38, um, we have pipeline regulations. Now, many of those regulations are very similar to the ones related to wells, but because a pipeline is not drilling a well uh, very deep, they're simply installing a pipeline under the ground, there are some, some key differences in those regulations. So I pull those out separately so that um, operators that come that are involved in, in a gathering system or other type of pipeline can see those regulations very specifically. And then finally, at the end, we have inspections and enforcement. All right, so look at, let's look at some more details here of these uh, best management practices that we are uh, implementing in the oil and gas manual. So section three, safety and security. So this includes things like a security plan, uh, access control, gates and fencing that are required uh, at different stages of the operations for the operators, uh, warning signs at the location, uh, a remote security plan. Uh, it also includes an emergency action plan, uh, including automatic safety systems, an emergency response plan, uh, and hazard analysis. We require the operators to uh, communicate and coordinate with uh, Aurora Emergency Services and other uh, jurisdictions such as Bennett um, and Watkins in some cases um, uh, to make sure that wherever they're, lo they're located, the uh, the local emergency services around that area are aware of the operations there and they're close to their facility uh, and are able uh, to respond to any type of uh, situation. Um, there's also a photometric plan. This is the lighting plan that describes um, what kind of lights the operator is going to use and how they need to point into the location and not shine out, uh, but provide extra security for the location. We have a chemical ban. We have a list of chemicals that are banned from use in hydraulic fracturing. Um, these are things that were included in the operator agreements, and we brought them over into the uh, oil and gas manual. And then finally, insurance requirements. We have um, robust uh, insurance requirements for the operators to make sure that um, should there be an incident or a spill, that there is uh, appropriate financial security uh, available to the operator to um, uh, provide the, the appropriate remediation uh, techniques. All right, section four, protection of water quality. Let's talk about some of these details. So two main categories here, surface water protection and groundwater protection. Uh, for surface water protection, we have uh, regulations around uh, wastewater and stormwater requirements. Uh, what happens if there's a rain event or a flood event? Where does that water go? What does it look like? How is it treated? We also have some setbacks that are included from certain surface features such as reservoirs, floodways, and other buried infrastructure such as pipelines, water pipelines. For groundwater protection, uh, there's a groundwater, a water quality monitoring plan that's required to be put into place um, so that uh, operators are required to sample the aquifers that are in the area near the well um, in order to um, understand what the water quality is and to determine if it changes over time. Uh, there's baseline sampling, so that, that starts with before the wells are drilled, there's an extensive list of items that have to be sampled for and, and measured for. In the, in the water samples. We also are requiring our operators to use a pitless drilling system. Now, what that means is that in the old days, operators, in order to uh, collect the, uh, the fluid or the drilling mud that's used to uh, turn the bit at the bottom of the drill pipe, they would dig a hole in the ground uh, to contain that mud. Um, we don't allow that now, so the, the pit has to be contained, it has to be an actual device 
that contains that those drilling fluids uh, and not be something that's just open into the ground. Uh, we have use of pipelines for primary transportation of fluids, and we have berms around the locations for fluid containment, and uh, of course a stormwater drainage plan is required as part of the uh, uh, groundwater protection. Uh, section 5, protection of air quality. Here's some items that you'll find in that section. Uh, the air quality monitoring plan, which includes a baseline air quality study before construction begins. Uh, obviously, the BMPs want to minimize all air emissions to the greatest extent possible. There's a leak detection plan and also a requirement for reduced work on the site on ozone action days. There are BMPs about odor, uh, fugitive dust suppression, noise, which requires a baseline study and some other BMPs, and a requirement for electric equipment, for electric line power to be used for any permanent facility that's uh, going to be put into place on the location. Section 6, this is protection of surface quality. Uh, in Section 6, you would find things like visual mitigation, such as uh, fencing and low-profile equipment. There's a, a traffic management plan that's required to, uh, uh, operators required to analyze the traffic flow during all phases of production to understand how that's going to affect uh, current traffic flow and impact that. There's a road maintenance agreement that's required uh, through public works so that uh, those traffic and road usages are understood throughout the life of the well and the operator is appropriately compensating the city for any damages um, or additional uh, access on those roads. There's a landscaping and weed control plan, um, cultural and historical resource protections, wildlife plan, uh, removal of unused equipment or trailers. So we, we do not allow our operators to um, leave unused equipment on a location. Once the equipment is no longer being used or if there's a trailer or something else like that, um, it has to be removed within a certain period of time. So we don't want our locations to be uh, a collecting point for old or unused equipment. Uh, we want those to be a minimal in terms of what's actually on the surface once production begins. There's a, a setback for parks and open spaces. And then finally, uh, reclamation, which is uh, both interim reclamation. Interim reclamation would be the phase uh, after the well is drilled and completed and during the production uh, life of the well. So there's an interim phase where the operator has to engage in certain activities uh, as they uh, decrease the size of the location or the pad. They have to make certain um, efforts to return the pad site to its native uh, original topography and original use. And then, of course, final reclamation would speak to the very end of life of the wells where um, the wells are plugged and abandoned uh, and the surface is, is completely remediated back to its original state. So that's section six. Um, beyond that in section seven are just general requirements. There are notifications for surface owners uh, within one mile of the oil and gas location. And that requirement uh, also applies to homeowners associations that might be within one mile of the location. There's requirements for notifications on incidences and spills. And then, of course, we have regulations around uh, inspection and in uh, enforcement. So those are all the sections that apply for uh, actual well sites within the city. Sections 31 through 38 uh, apply only to pipelines. Uh, again, many of these regulations are very similar or the same in some cases as what you would find in the sections for wells. But um, to the extent that they differ, um, they, you would find them here. We have, I have those broken out on the same topics as what we put in the well section. So we've got protection of water quality, protection of air quality, protection of surface quality, um, notifications, and then there's some additional construction requirements on the pipelines that we do not have for the wells. So as a local jurisdiction, Aurora is, uh, does not have legal authority over the downhole um, elements of a well bore. Those are under the purview of the uh, Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. But we do have some authority for regulating the construction of pipelines. And so we've got those included here um, in Section 38. So um, that concludes the, uh, the end of my prepared presentation. Um, I want to give you some instructions here that are on the screen about how you can access the, uh, the draft oil and gas manual. 
uh, how you can provide public comment, and the opportunities to provide comment here this evening. So the only gas manual is available on the Aurora City website. Um, if you are listening by phone, that is uh, www.aurora.gov.org forward slash oil and gas. And that's all spelled out. O-I-L-A-N-D-G-A-S, oil and gas. You can also just go to the webpage and, and do a search for oil and gas, and you should be able to find it as well. And that'll take you to the, uh, the webpage um, for our division. I would note that that webpage is under uh, development, so we've got some plans for adding additional information to that for the public, um, some maps, and some other resources that would provide valuable uh, information and easier access to the information re related to oil and gas um, than maybe it is to find it now. So that's where you can go. The uh, draft oil and gas manual is available as a PDF file. You can download it from that site. Um, public comments are being received through August 23rd uh, at the following email address, which is oilandgas at auroragov.org. Um, in this case, the uh, oil and gas is slightly different. It uses the and sign or the ampersand uh, instead of the word and. So the address would be O-I-L ampersand G-A-S at auroragov.org. That uh, email address is also on the website. Um, we have two virtual town halls scheduled, the first you're attending right now, thank you. Um, and the second will be on July 28th, also from 6 to 8 p.m. I believe that's a Tuesday night. Um, they will be the same in content. I will present the same content again on July 28th. Uh, but of course the questions uh, and answers may be different uh, during that event. So if you're attending tonight, um, there'll be no reason uh, no obligation to attend the next one because the information will be uh, theoretically the same, but of course you're, you're certainly welcome to if you like. Now, we're going to start now and open it to public comment. Um, there are two ways that you can do that. If you're viewing this by WebEx, there is a raise hand feature uh, that you can use to indicate that you would like to ask a question. If you're calling in by phone, um, the code is star 3 on your phone. So if you're calling in by phone, you can press star 3 uh, and that will is essentially the same as the raised hand feature. And uh, our host, our technical host, Randy, will be able to see that your hand is raised even though you're calling in. Um, once we start the uh, public comments, please do state your name and your city of residence. It will be very helpful. Um, and finally, uh, please keep your comments related to oil and gas matters. Um, we don't have any authority. I don't have any authority for other departments in the city. Um, those comments are welcome and valuable. Um, but there's other places that would be best to provide those. Um, here tonight, we're just looking at oil and gas related matters. Um, please do keep in mind the meeting is being recorded um, for our ability to go back in the future and provide uh, response to comments uh, and other things like that. So at this point, I'm going to leave this screen up so everyone can see the instructions on um, raising your hand. Um, Randy, I'm going to turn it back over to you and ask you to, uh, to call on people who might have their hands raised, um, and then we'll go from there. Okay, and I'll just take them in no particular order on the top and bottom, and I'll there. And so far, I don't see anybody very hands. Yes, I do. Uh, this is kind of the way I, we identify you if I don't know your name. First six Three zero three zero. I'm going to unmute. Three zero three three six zero for now. Unmute. Go ahead. Uh, hi there. I'm Pat Dunn. Is it my turn to ask a question? Yes. Hi there. Good evening. Um, I checked out the manual and I was wondering at section 3.08.3, .3, chemicals not permitted, I noticed that uh, toluene is not listed. Should it be? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I think the list is complete from what we have used in the past, um, but I'm certainly willing to look into that chemical. Um, that's okay, good. That's the, my first question. I got one, another one, real quick one. Under well, six point. 6.15.3, flow lines decommissioned. Um, in both instances, um, at 32.03, same thing, decommissioned. Uh, there's no timeline as far as uh, decommissioning the flow lines. 
should there not be a time frame in which to do this? I think it's a great question. Um, there are some regulations at the state level at COGCC in regarding timing of uh, plugging and abandoning in wells. And um, they have regulations around flow line decommissioning as well. Um, so, but that's a great question. I will look into that. Um, and if there is not a timeline at the COGCC level, um, I'll make sure that we add one here at this section. Great, perfect. Thank you so much for your comments. Do you have others? Uh, 7.01.2, you need to add the location of the well. You were talking about giving people um, information about uh, the location of wells and that type of thing, but there wasn't any place where you would add the location of the well. You're talking about resident notification of the neighborhood meeting? Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. That's a great uh, point. So in the notification that you would receive or a service owner would receive about the, about the neighborhood meeting, uh, it should contain all of the pertinent information. Well, Absolutely. Yes, it would include all that information that the surface owners and HOAs would receive. Um, that would okay, I just didn't see the location of the well listed, that's all. Um, so this list here is really just a timeline, so it's, it's indicating when the operator needs to provide notification. Um, mm -hmm. Specific elements. Um, gotcha. I'd like to include that. Um, that might be wise. Um, we, I don't know if we have a template, um, but we need for operators to include information. Um, but I think we probably should have one. I think that's a, a, great, a great idea. Now, on these setbacks at 4.024, the setbacks for the very uh, structures and the floodways and the reservoirs, is that a COGCC setback? No, these are in addition to COGCC. <clears throat> these are specific well, not, to the city of Aurora. Okay, not real, not real pleased with the, the setbacks for that or for the park and uh, open space 350 setback. Tell me some more about that. Um, you say you're not happy with it. You feel like they're not stringent enough or they're too... too uh, I think they should be set back more. I do know that you did put in the uh, manual that there would be mitigation um, if there were problems with the 350 foot setback. But at a park and at open spaces, I wouldn't think that the 350 setback would be um, adequate. Yes, and I think the 350 foot setback from parks and open spaces is related to the um, pipeline section uh, more specifically. It's at 6.14. There, 6.14. 36.14? Yeah, I think it's 36. Not quite. It might be just 6.14, because that's what I've got down. Well, by any means, wherever it is, um, I really don't think 350 feet setback is adequate for parks or open space. I was wondering if we could do something uh, something with that setback. In other words, increase it. Sure, I understand. Um, yeah, so this is something new. This is, I don't believe this particular setback is required at all at the COGCC level for parks and open space. So this is mm -hmm. something that's implemented uh, new at the city that's not been in place in the past. So uh, I will make a note of that to uh, discuss that with staff. I would appreciate it very much because that is just not, that's just not enough setback. That's it on my, my uh, time. Well, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I appreciate your, your, your diligent reading of the manual and, and your excellent comments. That's excellent. Um, if you do have any additional ones, uh, please feel free to reach out, you know, in the next month um, at, the, at the email address. I do want to uh, compliment you on the fact uh, with the inspections that you didn't give them 48 hours or three days or four days to, you know, before the inspection would take place. That was a huge improvement. I want to thank you for that. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And um, so. Randy, if I could just make a technical note, it's uh, it's pretty hard for me to hear you. You're you're cutting in and out a little bit, so it's okay. difficult. Oh, that's better. 
Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at two monitors here, so I'll try to look over at one and stay near one. That's much better. I want to make sure our public has a chance to hear when it's their turn to. Uh... Absolutely. No, I appreciate that feedback. All right. So I am unmuting. Three zero three seven five zero are the first uh, six digits of the phone number. Three zero three seven five zero. You are now unmuted. Hi. Um, I think. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, sure can. Oh, okay. Okay, this is Randy Webb, and I'm in Aurora in Ward 4. Hello, Randy. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask some kind of general questions. Uh, for example, um, what does the uh, oil and gas manual have as far as addressing cumulative impacts, like um, when there's Oh, I'm thinking of the Jamiso well site. I believe it's near um, an oil and gas facility, a processing facility that's probably not in Aurora, but they are near each other and they're near the residences. Uh, is there some way that that's being handled because it would be like double pollution or something? Does the city have a larger minimum distance between the well pad um, and um, residential, schools, businesses, that kind of thing, when there are more than one thing going on? Um, we do not at this point. So each facility would have their own set of requirements, uh, setback requirements from various surface features, as you mentioned. Um, but we don't have any, any specific regulations regarding cumulative impacts about multiple locations you know, within a certain area. Um, when we have operators that do have multiple locations in a field, um, we do require a, a certain field-wide plans, so they have to provide certain um, information to us of how their operations coordinate together. But uh, those do not address cumulative impacts really at this point uh, that, that, I, that I'm aware of. Okay, that is a part of the uh, local control of Senate Bill 181. That's Cumulative impacts can be addressed, so I feel like they should be, uh, because that definitely makes a difference as far as health to have more than one kind of pollution going on. I understand. So you're saying that, for example, um, an operator might drill a well and it might meet the setback criteria from certain uh, surface features like residences and schools, so forth and so on, but then potentially another um, operator could drill right next door uh, that meets the same setback requirements, but there is a cumulative impact of, due to the fact that there are multiple, now multiple uh, locations that are like very close together. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's something I think we will look at uh, and see what we can add to address that. Um, I will say that based on the nature of uh, oil and gas development at this stage of, of history, um, what we typically find is that there's a, a single pad that has multiple wells on that pad. And those wells right. are drilled below the surface and then horizontally out away from the pad. So they're accessing a quite a large area um, underneath where the actual pad is drilled. So for, in that particular case, I wouldn't expect to have um, a lot of different uh, pads from different operators co-located in the same area. But that's not the example you gave. You gave a different facility type, so um, right. I mean, we've not. And I, 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 I do that. believe that exists right out there, and probably elsewhere. I don't know. Um, also, I wonder, um, in that regard, is the city limiting how many wells can be on a pad, or um, probably more specifically, a pad of size X would only be allowed so many wells? That might be, come in the permitting, but I think the manual would want to cover that. Yes, yeah, certainly we're trying to put everything related to permitting processes uh, into the manual. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have any limits at this time. So as we look at the, the big picture of things, um, in general, it's, it's a better use of land uh, to have fewer pads and have more wells on that pad. Um, the reason is, even to have one well on a pad, there's a certain minimum size that pad has to be. Um, you've got the well, you've got production equipment, um, you would have to have uh, 
space on that pad to get large equipment in, if uh, maintenance work was required on the pad, or in order to do the plugging at the end of the life of the well. So there's, there's kind of like a minimum size that a pad has to be just for one well. If you go from one well to two well, it's a very minimal percentage increase in the size of pad because the well head is very small and uh, additional production equipment that might be associated with that second well um, is generally very small also. And so um, in, in general, big picture, um, our preference is to have a lower, a lesser number of pads, but to have more wells on that pad. Because if you look at the great, you know, the greater extent of uh, the city limits of Aurora, that long term, that's the best use of, of surface uh, space. Um, because we're, we're consolidating those wells and having greater ability to um, let that one pad service a much larger area. Yes, I, I do understand that, and I appreciate your explaining it. Um, but it is my understanding that the more wells you have, even if they're not active at the moment, they've been active, um, they have the possibility, the likelihood to leak and um, in some fashion. And so the more you have, again, the greater the impact will be. It adds up to be more and more. And so I would hope that um, where there are more wells or more development activity, that um, there would be greater setback. That's a, that's a great uh, perspective. I really appreciate you expressing that. Um, certainly all the wells, or any individual well, has the same uh, best management practices requirements, the same BMP requirements, um, which include leak detections and, and, and various other things. So wherever a well is, uh, or however many wells there are per pad, we want to make sure that all the wells uh, are meeting the, the requirements, both of Aurora and COGCC. So um, we certainly will do our best to make sure through uh, inspections and enforcement that, that all wells are maintained uh, under the, the correct regulations. Um, but you know, providing additional step back if, uh, if a pad is of a certain size or a certain amount of well, that's an interesting concept. And uh, I'm going to have to think about that. I really appreciate that. Okay. Sure. Um, can I ask another question? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, uh, you highlighted that the manual speaks to um, insurance uh, as a safety net for you know, if things might happen um, on the well pad yeah. um, or the pipeline, I guess, as well. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, is there a bond set for each and every well? I do know that the COGCC requires a bond, um, but their requirements right now and for this foreseeable future are something like 60000 per well. Um, and then they cap how many wells um, a company would have to put bond money up for, whereas we now know that the typical well costs about 250000 to, I don't know if the right word is plug or shut in or close, I'm not sure of those terms, but we're having a lot of companies walk away before they would uh, close or shut in a well. And the um, state is paying to do that. I don't know if you're familiar with the COGCC's work on that. They've got a list that I know at the end of 2019 had at least 600 wells. And the list they were expecting, they knew it was growing. And they'd only addressed um, two or 300 of those wells using money from the general funds, which is Aurora taxpayer money, as well as the rest of the state. Um, and so th I think the main reason they hadn't addressed more is the money issue. So I think that it would be wise for Aurora to be proactive about this and say that, you know, it's great that you want to do so many wells. Well, I actually, I don't have that opinion. But anyhow, if, um, you know, whatever number of wells a company would want to be doing on a particular pad or what they think they will at that moment, 
Um, they don't drill them all at once anyhow, I don't believe, but um, they would have to have that kind of money for bonds that would be held by the city. And um, then, you know, obviously once they have shut it in, closed it, whatever, they get that money back and they can do more. You know, then they can apply for a permit on another. And I would imagine they, they do more than one at a time. But um, I think we should require that money for our own financial security. Uh, again, great questions. And um, you've obviously done a lot of research, and that's, that's, that's wonderful. I really appreciate uh, that and your, your partnership here. So you're correct. The state does require, the CGCC requires uh, certain bonds to be in place. Uh, for plugging of wells, which would be final reclamation, uh, plugging of wells and the sites, uh, the well sites. Um, and there is, has certainly been discussion about the cost of plugging modern wells, what the cost is, and is the bonds enough? Um, those are all valid you know, concerns that you're raising. Um, I would say two things in, in response to that. One is um, some of those values of bonding requirements uh, will be under discussion at QGCC upcoming. Uh, in August and mm -hmm. in, in the fall. So there's some mm -hmm. discussion there, and I would certainly encourage you to uh, provide provide feedback to uh, CGCC as well uh, on your thoughts on that. The second is uh, a matter of legal concern, and that is that the city, and really any local jurisdiction, does not have legal authority over the uh, downhole well bore. Um, COGCC is the only uh, regulatory body in the state that has authority over the downhole well bore. So we have to be careful that we don't um, make certain requirements in our rules that would appear to, to take authority from the state um, because there's, there's significant risk to the city in that case uh, in the sense that um, you know the state might say, well, you're now fully responsible for all the well bores and um, we don't have the funds and aren't requiring the bonds as you said. So there are some legal issues behind that uh, regarding local versus state authority, um, and our city attorneys have have you know provided insight uh, to to our division that um, because the authority over the actual boards themselves downhole um, reside at the CGCC, that they're the ones that need to make those decisions and be responsible for uh, you know plugging orphan wells that may be abandoned by an operator. Um, but again, I think that your comments are, are certainly valid, and I would encourage you to provide those to COGCC as they're engaged in updating the rules uh, here this fall. Well, okay, and I appreciate that. And um, uh, you say they'll be discussing that in August, you think? Uh, yes, the next, the, the Professional Commission, uh, Oil and Gas Commission, just got seated on July 1st. Um, that was a mm -hmm. statutory requirement. And so there's been a change of commissioners that just happened. Um, they right. engaged in rulemaking all through the spring, but when it got close to July 1st, um, they put a pause on those rulemaking processes and said we're going to we're going to delay until beginning of August. I think it begins August 24th is the next round of um, hearings. Now that's going to be uh, hearings where they actually discuss the changes. It, even still now, uh, various. Uh, entities that are parties to the rulemaking, such as the city of Aurora, we're already providing feedback on the draft rules and regulations that they put out. So, so there's work ongoing now at the COGCC, but the uh, the public hearings and, and whatnot will be occurring in August, I believe, starting the 24th. Uh-huh. Um, now, what appears to me most important, even more than the financial, which can certainly bankrupt us, um, is that if they walk away and we're waiting for the COGCC to complete the uh, well bore down hole, as you say, um, in the meantime, that'll be leaking. And that's a threat to our health, our safety, and the environment. Um, so waiting on the COGCC and the state to find money and why should we be paying it at all? I mean, it just seems like, well, maybe a better way or an additional way in my mind to come around is to um, have rules and maybe you have it 
um, like we do or somewhat similar to what we do for other kinds of businesses to look into their finances and say, um, yeah, this is a good company to do business with. They have a good financial reputation. They don't have large debt. You know, they have a good safety and the remediation reputation. That would be part of plugging, um, you know, that their financial and ethical standing of their affiliates should be considered as well since they most often work with affiliates. Um, those kinds of things, are are they uh, considerations in the manual? Um, so let me address a couple of different things. I'll start with the one from the end there, uh, mm -hmm. and the uh, reputation. So we don't have the ability to look into the financial records of a company, um, and I don't think we have the ability, even if we did look into there, to predict, even if it uh, uh, appears to be well managed, that doesn't mean that a company can't make poor decisions or, or make decisions and you know, as a company that put them in a situation in the future uh, that would be would be perilous in some way. So we don't have the ability to do that. We try to mitigate that through the insurance requirements. Um, and then again, understanding the bonding levels at QGCC. Um, we do definitely make sure that when we when an operator comes to the city, um, that we uh, evaluate their ability to um, uh, adhere to all the best management practices. So that's the first step in the process. The, the operator comes into the city, they have a pre-submittal meeting um, where they basically informally propose, hey, we're looking to drill uh, these wells at this location, um, here's what this looks like, and those are the kind of questions that we might ask the operator at that time. Well, are you aware of what our best management practices are? Um, what, are your, what are your plans for putting these in place and putting those in place? Um, so we can we can ask questions and get some, some feedback from the operator at that point. Um, but I believe that's about the limit to what we can do uh, at you know at that point with the operators. Um, right. Well, earlier in your conversation, um, you said that um, the wells would be leaking. Um, so I, I would disagree with that. That's really incorrect uh, in most cases. So as long as the valves are closed and intact. Uh, there's nothing that's leaking anywhere, either above ground or below ground from the wells. Just because an operator may have walked away from a well, uh, that does not specifically indicate that the well is leaking um, or, or harmful to the environment in any particular way. Um, so that's something that if that situation were to arise, we would certainly uh, increase inspection frequency on that location to make sure that everything is is um, as it's supposed to be, and again, the location is secure uh, from unauthorized folks um, accessing the uh, the location and, and causing issues. But the, just because it's abandoned does not mean that it's specifically leaking. Um, it, it could be, but those things are not necessarily synonymous. And then the last thing was you had said that um, uh, an abandoned well would might bankrupt the city. Um, I, I don't really know quite what you mean on that. Again, the responsibility for uh, plugging the well would be the responsibility of the COGCC. Um, where they get the funds for that, that's, that's not my responsibility or, or authority. Um, if we have a well that was became orphaned, um, we would certainly work with the COGCC very closely uh, to make sure that that well was plugged appropriately uh, and as quickly as possible. Um, so from that perspective, there's there's no financial risk to the city uh, of a well that uh, that might be abandoned. Okay, well that is not my understanding um, uh, at all. I know that all cement will crack and therefore leak. Um, some of them right away. Some of them within ten years. Um, I, I just you know I. The facts that I have are quite different than what you're describing. Um, and I know we can look at the SEC reports that are open to the public um, as far as how a company is doing. When it's a privately owned company, of course, it's more difficult. But right. as Marsha Burson um, uh, thinks of different businesses, she has always asked about their reputation. What have they done in Colorado before or elsewhere if they're new to Colorado? 
um, that kind of thing. And I, I'm guessing it sounds like we're not going to be asking those questions when it comes to oil and gas companies. Uh, again, just to reiterate what I've said before, you know, we certainly want to make sure that the operator, that we feel that they're able to um, adhere to all the best management practices and regulations that we require. Uh, for the operators that had a, uh, an operator agreement with the city, I think the city may have done additional due diligence on those particular operators since it was a legal agreement. Um, but we are somewhat limited in our ability to, uh, to what questions we can ask. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your questions uh, tonight. And if you have more, you're welcome to send those to the uh, email address if you have questions or comments. I welcome those to be sent there. And uh, Randy, as we move on to the next person, I, because I'm showing my screen, I'm not able, a, unable to see how many folks may be participating and have their hands. Mm. So, um, Randy, uh, Randy Simpson, if you could maybe let me know as you introduce the next person how many folks we have uh, that may want to speak tonight. I want to make sure we get to as many as possible. We still have an hour left on the schedule. Um, I'm just unaware if we have uh, two people or 200. So, uh, oh, we at least have one other waiting right now. So I'll I'll go ahead and bring her over. Very good. Um, actually, so yeah, um, take out this one. Um, Sonia, I'm not seeing that you have a that I'm uh, able to uh, unmute you. Uh, for whatever reason, um, I'm going to go ahead and see if this works. Are you able to talk now, Sonia? Let me bring Sonia over temporarily as a panelist to see. I'm not seeing that you have a microphone connected, Sonia. At least it's not. So if you're if you're on the WebEx now, Sonia, if you would. Look at the three dots at the bottom of your screen, and then under there you'll see um, it'll say audio and video connections. Speaker, microphone, and camera will pop up, and just make sure there you go. And now unmute your microphone, Sonia, and you should be able to talk to us. Hi, Hi. we do. Perfect. My name is Sonia Stackett-Scrumma. I live in Aurora. I'm very glad to see um, this revision of the Aurora ordinances. I know it's a lot of work. Um, I do have some concerns, though. <clears throat> so we require people to report violations of laws and require the police to monitor for violations of laws because violators don't normally self-report. <laughs> but Aurora's ordinances are based primarily on that premise of self-report and on a quarterly basis with compliance reports, with no real enforcement provision, no clear um, or required levying of fines and penalties that Colorado law now allows. And this doesn't appear to be a viable approach, especially for an industry that has a record of massive violations of EOGCC regulations and violations that lead to so much harm to public health and safety and the environment. Other Colorado governments' um, revisions of ordinances have required independent experts chosen by that government um, to do independent air, water, and soil assessments baseline and periodically, paid for by the operator. That way, there's um, independent, verifiable, objective evidence regarding violations as opposed to industry promises. And I think that's really critical. Um, so I would ask you to reconsider including that approach in Aurora's ordinances. Um, also, other local governments have required submission of information <clears throat> uh, to assess the appropriateness of an applicant based on SB 181 law. Uh, and two things in particular. One is to submit information that would allow the local government 
to review the financial fitness of the company to perform the entire contract for its lifespan, which would have been really important in Aurora, for example, <laughs> with extraction, or, and also to um, require submission at the application stage again by the operator of a certified record of past performance that includes all violations and all incidents so that the city or the local government can have an idea of what the performance is actually of this entity. And both of those seem like very prudent, important uh, kind of standard business type um, approaches that our city should include. I also noted that um, in certain sections addressing, for example, water pollution or soil pollution, it states that um, the operator, in the case of a pollution of a waterway, shall pay its, quote, proportionate share. Well, if the operator does the polluting, its proportionate share is all of the costs of <laughs> cleaning it up. That should, so proportionate seems very inappropriate uh, as a modifier there. It also states that in terms of emergency events, that uh, emergency services, quote, reasonable expenses will be paid by the operator. And again, it doesn't seem appropriate for the operator to determine what the appropriate expenses are by uh, emergency services, that's up to emergency services. And it seems like the operator should be liable for all of the costs for dealing with an emergency and created. So again, that's something I think is important to modify. Can I make one more comment or am I out of time? No, please do. Okay. So, all right. So Randy also made a I think it was Randy who made a comment, uh, or maybe it was Pat, about, uh, the, I think it was Pat, about the distance um, of 350 feet for parks and uh, public uh, open spaces. Right. Mm -hmm. And the reason that that's so inappropriate as a distance is that when people are recreating in an open space, they're breathing more heavily, inspiring more deeply, and inhaling more of any toxic uh, materials that particulate or other toxic gases in the air. And that's particularly the case for vulnerable populations, children, pregnant women, elderly, people with respiratory or uh, cardio conditions. And 350 feet, um, <laughs> I would categorize it as almost criminal. It just is too little and it doesn't offer any protection for public health. Um, it should be a greater distance than the distance required from residential areas. Then it's an area where people are inspiring uh, and expiring uh, more quickly, more deeply, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Sonia, thank you so much for your uh, your time. And again, I, I, I truly appreciate uh, members of our public uh, to actually read the regulations and these are uh, actionable steps that we can take as well. Um, and yet, I'm a little bit of feedback from your side. So perhaps uh, if you have the ability to mute your uh, microphone. Okay, that's better. Very good. Um, we can certainly allow you to speak again here in a moment. Um, I just we're getting a little bit of feedback. I want to make sure everyone can hear clearly. Um, so let me respond. I made some notes here from your from your questions. Um, first of all, on the reporting issue, um, when you said that, that self-reporting is what's required of, of current operators and, and uh, violators of regulations don't typically self-report their violations. That, that's a fair point, a very fair point. Um, we do have you know, inspections that are required uh, for these sites. And um, that is something that, you know, at every inspection, we would look for any evidence of, of violations. 
Um, but that's a great point. And uh, I would like to, uh, if you have specific, uh, you mentioned other, other jurisdictions that have, require independent organizations to um, review operations from, from these operators. Um, if you've got a particular jurisdiction that you have in mind, or a particular section of, of code that you could refer to me that I could review. Um, I can certainly search for it on my own, but um, if you've got that ready at hand, I'd certainly welcome to know um, during a moment what those uh, are, because that might be something we want to uh, we'll consider here in Aurora. Um, you indicated on Citizen Bill 181 that it does allow local jurisdictions some additional uh, opportunities to review financials of different companies uh, and earlier violations. Um, that's something I would, I would like to look into. Um, I've not seen that specific uh, line of provision yet, so let me look into that um, and see what we can determine. Certainly, we do want to make sure that um, you know the operators we're working with are financially sound to the greatest extent that we can we can do that. Um, it's just that we've had limited ability to do that um, in in the past, but certainly we, we that is a priority. We do want to do that to the extent that we can. So. Um, any authority that we have that provides us um, greater ability to ask certain questions, that's something we would certainly uh, consider. Um, you mentioned the word proportionate, uh, and I'm finding that in section 34-3-1, um, where the, the operator would pay a proportionate cost of, of remediation. I uh, totally agree with you. Um, I wasn't even aware that word was in there like that. You are exactly correct. Uh, in terms of proportionate, if an operator causes a, uh, a spill or other violation, uh, their share would be, their proportionate share would be 100%. So I think we can remove the word proportionate there and just make it very clear that they're responsible to, um, you know, for cleaning up or remediating any issues that they cause. Um, the final thing is on the 300 foot setback, 350 foot setback on parks and open space. Uh, again, very good, good thing to consider there. Um, you suggested that that might need to be a greater setback than residences. And uh, I would have to give that some consideration to think about that different terms. Um, you know, at this point, I don't believe there's been any requirement at the COGCC level, specifically for the category of parks and open space. So this is something that we're trying to require, uh, you know, as a, as a place to start. But I think your, your comments related to the fact that in an open space, certainly some people are, are there lounging, but others are there uh, recreating and, and maybe in, engaged in activities that um, either they're running or jogging or playing sports or something that um, they are respirating, you know, in a greater way than someone might be, you know, sitting on the back porch at home. So um, that's very interesting, and we'll certainly take that into consideration um, as we, you know, review all the public comments, you know, for the oil and gas manual. And um, that's a response to what you provided so far. If you can unmute yourself or uh, if our host can unmute you, I'm happy to take additional questions and have your, your feedback on what said. Thank you so much. I do appreciate that. Um, and especially your rapid response regarding the, the word of the, the deletion of that word appropriate or proportionate expenses. Would that also apply regarding the emergency services? I think so. Uh, I'm only finding that word in two places uh, in the document. One was in regards to an air modeling study, um, which has nothing to do with remediation. The other place on proportionate was here, the section that I mentioned under groundwater uh, in the pipeline section, which is 34.3.1, 34 is the other place I find the word proportionate. Um, the word starts in the document. So if there's another place that you're seeing that word or written, um, you know, you know, I'm certainly looking for that. Yeah, I found it in the emergency response section. I'll, I, I can email you that when I send you my comments. I'll refer to that specifically. Yes. But yeah, that wasn't that was another instance I was going to bring up the air modeling. Uh, all these other local governments require uh, during the application process, they require uh, and periodically the operator to pay air modeling and other expenses. And I don't see why Aurora should <clears throat> stand out <laughs> to offer up, you know, partial payments for it. That doesn't seem reasonable either. 
Um, with regard to the code you were asking for, I do have specific language. I will email it to you with a written response. Uh, there are several local governments I found um, that have codes as I described. And uh, I do appreciate your consideration of these issues. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And yes, if you have that section on the uh, word proportionate and the emergency section, uh, I'm just not seeing it at the moment, but I'm just trying to scan quickly. So uh, if you do have that, I would definitely want to uh, get that. In, in regards to the section you just mentioned, which is the, um, the air modeling study, so that is something uh, that initiated prior to my time with the city. And what I've understood about that at this point is that was uh, an, an early leaning towards the cumulative impact uh, of multiple wells, you know, in the area, and that that is a uh, something that we might engage in. And in that case, when it says the operator would pay their proportionate share, that's meant that uh, if the study was initiated, that it would be paid for only by the operators uh, within the city, and that each operator would pay a proportionate share proportional to the number of wells or well pads that they have within the city at the time the study is done. Um, not that they would pay a cost and the city would pay a cost. That was the intent of that of that section. Oh, I understand now. Thank you. That looks like a, a promising thing to do in the future uh, in order to assess cumulative impact. An area I've really been very concerned about um, is the one that Randy mentioned, and that is near the Jamaso well site. Um, I think it was maybe Earth Guardians that went out there a couple of years ago with floor cameras and uh, recorded the emissions from the Wattenberg and uh, Oosterus energy plants, which are right next door to each other. They were astronomical. They'd never seen anything like it. And when I went to research and look for their uh, APEN um, air pollution you know, uh, application, one of them, I think it was the Wattenberg, I'm not sure, one of them didn't have any on file. I, I couldn't find it, and I went back and forth with CDPHE about that. But they were clearly emitting tons of, you know, particulate matter and benzene, et cetera, from previous reports. And they're located less than half a mile from Fox Ridge Mobile Home Center that has about, I don't know, 800 families. And that particular mobile home area is located in a um, geologically depressed area. So during cold weather, there's a temperature inversion that can trap so much of the uh, pollution that's coming off the two giant emitters. And so I'm concerned that Aurora put some provision in its ordinances um, to require um, more clear emissions um, declarations and inspections of existing facilities such as those, and then incorporating that into a cumulative impact study because those people are getting bombarded and now they have the, the well that thankfully didn't go up yet that would be on the other side of them. So that's an area of, of really significant concern in terms of cumulative impact. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the plant that you mentioned, the Blue Spruce plant and the other one, uh, are those located within the city of Aurora? Um, I believe they have Aurora as their um, city. I'm, I'm not, I'm pretty sure they do. Um, just as Fox Ridge Farms is within the city. Although technically, I think maybe Blue Spruce is in the city and Wattenberg, which is what, 50 feet away from it, might be city of Watkins. I'm not sure. That would have to be researched. The point is they're, they're all, you know, very close together and emit right in Aurora, in a population that's um, in a very precarious geologic position. Yes, that's interesting your concern. Um, 
I'm looking at the map, I think maybe one of those is in the city limits of Roar, and the, there's two others nearby um, that are that are not. Uh, the, the, your point remains the same, whether they're in the city or not in the city. Um, if, the, if the facility is not in the city itself, then you know, Aurora doesn't have any authority over the actual facility. However, um, we are you know, engaged with our, our county partners, uh, with Adams County and Arapahoe County. I've been in contact with the uh, local government designees for, for each of those um, and the folks that are working in the oil and gas department. And any time that a facility um, is, is to be drilled or to be built, uh, if it's within a certain distance of a uh, uh, another government lo local jurisdiction, then we have the ability to comment uh, on those on those proceedings uh, before the uh, CRGCC. And so that's something I, I again appreciate you pointing this out because um, you know I tend to think more along the lines of just the wells and the well pad uh, at this point as I'm you know getting into the city business with oil and gas. But certainly there are other facilities and types of facilities that uh, may have the opportunity for emissions that uh, even if we're not regulating them directly, they still may impact uh, citizens in Aurora and in the area. So I think there's probably opportunity for greater coordination with our, our county partners um, in regards to um, maybe not necessarily citing, but at least if not citing rules and regulations, then uh, at a minimum, you know, discussing inspection frequency and, and rules and regulations for the facilities themselves. Thank you so much. If I could just make one more comment, I don't know if there's someone in line behind me. Please, I think we've got plenty of time, so please go ahead. Perfect. Okay, so um, I was wondering about, um, for example, Arapahoe County and numerous other counties and, and local governments have specifically stated in their ordinances that they will not allow wastewater injection wells because of you know, their association with uh, tremor and, you know, induced earthquake activity, et cetera. And I, I think that's important to include in Aurora, and here's one of the reasons why. Um, I sit on the Lowry Landfill Citizens Advisory Committee for the um, Superfund site at Lowry Landfill and became aware that there's a suspected geologic fault that's underneath the plume of leachate toxic chemicals coming out of, of Lowry Mantle. And if you, you know, had an injection well close by, you can have uh, an intersectionality of, you know, disasters, like a recipe for disaster. And I don't think that we're, I think that uh, Citizens Advisory Committee, we've been trying to get, um, the work settling defendants or, or someone to proceed to verify is there indeed a, you know a geologic fault there or is there not uh, that's pertinent information but there are also numerous department of defense toxic sites that uh, distance needs to be maintained from in terms of you know underground activity and tremors and so on and flammable and i think that those special case circumstances need to be addressed in the ordinances to set boundaries stating that, you know, in the, in the instance of uh, toxic, known toxic sites, et cetera, or known geologic hazards, that, um, you know, the setbacks will be uh, adjusted to better, you know, support public safety or something. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm just making notes here and capture those things uh, appropriately. Um, so let me let me address the injection well question. And I've had I've had numerous discussions with Aurora Water, um, and and this is a concern that they share as well. Aurora is a little bit um, unique in the metro area in that we own um, a lot of water rights that are actually underneath the city and the, and the reservoirs underneath the city. Uh, and that's a very important to Aurora Water, uh, even though we get a lot of our water, I think 
all of our water at this point from other places um, and mountain reservoirs and things like that. The water that's below us, um, they want to make sure that's maintained for the future. Um, and as you know, if there's ever any issues with other water supply, that we have the water below us uh, in order to access it. So that's very much of a concern of the lower water. I believe that the uh, there's a prohibition on injection wells within their rules and regulations. Um, I made a note to check on that uh, to verify that. I can communicate that back with you um, via email. I would point that in our oil and gas manual in section 4.3.3. Um, we discuss underground injection control wells, and um, it says for operations associated with any oil and gas location, the operator shall not develop, use, operate, or contract with any third party for the use of any class two underground injection control wells within the city limits. Um, so that we definitely share your concern with that, um, and that's the regulation we do have in the manual at this point. Uh, and I believe that rural water may have additional. Um, rules and regulations about underground injection of wastewater as well. But I will, I've made a note about that to follow up um, with you by email on that particular question. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it. I guess I missed that in, in reading <laughs> that long document. That's okay. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, okay. 4.3.3. I will check that. So, um, would you be willing to consider setting some special case boundaries, like I suggested, in terms of uh, Department of Defense and other known toxic uh, disposal sites, and uh, you know, a national um, site like Lowry Landfill? That those would be special cases. I'm adding some words in the ordinance that would make it clear that well, if, if uh, an operator wants to you know, go within five miles of those, that there will be special review processes pertaining to public safety agencies. Yes, I'm definitely willing to consider that. Um, I, I can't speak to five miles, it's a long distance, but um, I definitely think that some level of review of the city is here, um, more additional sites than what we have listed currently and I think that what you're bringing up is some things that um, probably get overlooked in many cases and uh, I think that's very valuable information so I'm, I'm appreciating you you uh, highlighting those things for me. Um, I would need to, do a bit, need, to do a little, need to do a little bit of research to uh, understand what those situations look like currently um, both within the city of Aurora and nearby Aurora so that we can understand, you know, what's the extent of those sites, um, where are they, and uh, see what research has been done on past research has been done on um, on those sites, you know, specifically or sites like that of those types. Um, and then at that point, we could uh, provide some comments on whether or not a setback would be appropriate for and what that setback would be for those particular special features. Terrific. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for your comments. And again, I really, truly appreciate you taking time to um, to review the work that we put together. And um, I, I really do see this as a partnership uh, between our division and our stakeholders uh, to provide valuable feedback to us. Um, and, and this is the way that, that things get done. Uh, we hear your concerns uh, and we do our best to address those uh, in the right way possible. Jeff, we have nobody else with their hand up right now. Okay. Um, why don't we give just a couple more minutes here, and um, if we have someone else that maybe joins uh, late, um, it's 7:30, so uh, maybe we'll just say 7:32. Uh, um, I'm happy to go to 8 o'clock if um, we think that people might be joining, uh, you know, super late. I don't mind staying on, uh, keeping the channel open if someone were to join. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to shut off communications early since we set it from six to eight o'clock. Um, at the same time, if there's no one else that is joining at this time, I, I suppose, Randy, uh, for the sake of um, uh, communication, since we have communicated until eight o'clock, um, let's go ahead and, and keep the meeting open until eight o'clock, um, and then we'll just check and see if anyone else um, joins in. 
Uh, I'm also willing, I think we may have some uh, council members on the phone, and if uh, there's any council members that would like to, uh, to speak on that question of what you would typically do in other situations, um, I'm, I'm willing to receive that input. Again, since I'm kind of new to the city, I'm not sure what typical procedure would, would expect in a situation like this when we've advertised an event uh, between certain times from 6 to 8 p.m. Again, I do want to recognize someone could join here, you know, in the next few minutes and, and have some questions and we would want to answer those. Um, at the same time, I know a lot of people are on the meeting, uh, you know, listening in and, uh, and, and certainly you're willing to, uh, to uh, end the call uh, early. We've had nobody join in the last 30 minutes, I think. We had one council member join, I don't remember, a while ago, but nobody's joined in maybe the last 20 or 30 minutes. Okay. All right. Well, then here's what I'm going to say. I'll make a decision. Since we do have an additional uh, town hall scheduled on July 28th, um, I think it's fair now since you're telling me that no one's joined in 30 minutes. Um, I think it makes sense to go ahead and end the meeting at this time. And um, knowing that there is another virtual town hall on July 28th from 6 to 8 p.m., um, and certainly that will continue to be advertised on the Aurora website and on Aurora social media. Uh, and so if anyone else wants to join uh, and provide verbal comments, they're always welcome to do it at that time. And of course, uh, written comments are always welcome. And I would just say to the public that may still be on the phone here, um, I think that, uh, you know, I want to make you aware or, or just let you know my opinion, which is I am happy to receive your comments at any time. Uh, you don't have to wait until we are um, engaged in a rulemaking process, official rulemaking process, or official public comment period in order to submit uh, comments to me or, or ask questions. Um, I want to be transparent and open to the public uh, and be available for any questions that you have. Uh, I am working on some educational resources that we could post on the website uh, for those that are just trying to get more information about what's happening in Aurora. Um, again, make the information easier to find when permits are coming in um, and things like that. So those are going to be upcoming in the future. Uh, we are trying to get this oil and gas manual into public comment and uh, begin to work through the, the process of approving it at the city. Um, but following this, then um, there's lots of other things that will be, be forthcoming in the future. So um, thanks, everyone, again, for your participation. Um, uh, Jeffrey, um, we did actually, I, I'm not sure whether you answered the question. It looks like Sonia might have one additional question that she asked if she could ask. So yes, I'll, uh, I'll unmute you. Uh, you have a question, Sonia? Oh, I just wanted to follow up if I could. Um, I had mentioned in my earliest comments about the fact that Colorado law currently allows uh, local governments to levy fines and penalties, and some local governments do that and they state specifically what sorts of things they will levy fines and penalties on and the amount up to they will levy it for and how they will expect things to be remedied and the duration and all those things. Whereas our enforcement states that Aurora may levy fines or penalties. And that's, that's really weird law. <laughs> when you say that you may levy fines and penalties for violations, especially since they're so significant to our climate, to our health, to so many different domains. Uh, it seems imperative that if they're going to violate the terms of their contract, that levies and fines should be levied. And it also, you know, if they're going to uh, violate the terms, uh, other Municipalities also state that they have the right to totally revoke the contract if desired or proceed to, you know, court proceedings, et cetera. But if you don't follow up with enforcement, you're back to like the self report stance and the, you know, you've got nothing to, to lean back on other than COGCC. And COGCC often waives and, uh, you know, settles the smaller fines, et cetera. I think it's important in this economic downturn to, um, you know, require that they pay their, their share when they violate. Well, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you for, uh, for that comment. Um, yeah, you know, I'm looking at that now, and, and certainly I think the word may there is, is inappropriate. Um, yes, we will impose uh, penalties when there's violations. Um, I did not list a lot of specific 
uh, amount, or I didn't list any specific amount here in the oil and gas manual. Um, the reason for that is I under, my understanding is that there's other provisions of code that address um, fines and uh, for violations. Um, that's something we're checking into through the city attorney's office uh, to make sure that that is, you know, appropriately referenced. For those things, if there are things that are specific to oil and gas that are not included in other places in code, those will be included here uh, in the oil and gas manual. Um, in terms of revoking a contract, so the contracts that we have with the operator agreement uh, with two operators uh, currently for, for well locations, um, and I'm not a lawyer, but it seems to me that um, revoking a contract might not be the, the appropriate avenue of redress, because if you revoke the contract, then it seems like that the, that would re actually remove the operator's liability um, from any future work on that site. And I think that it is the contract itself uh, for those that have operator agreements that provide um, some opportunity for the city to, to address you know, those violations. Again, for those operators that will come in in the future under the oil and gas manual, rather than an operator agreement, um, we would have enforcement ability through the uh, other provisions of the Royal Municipal Code. Uh, and those, those uh, penalty amounts, like I said, I'm, I'm, that's something I'm coordinating through the city attorney's office to understand what's there currently and what might need to be placed specifically in the oil and gas manual related to oil and gas activity. Thank you very much. I see your point about revoking. I think they were holding that as a, a last uh, resort, um, just pointing out what all their options are. So I'm just saying it's important to be specific. And so if there are, you know, other provisions and other ordinances, then those should be clearly listed. So it's clear to everybody what those are. Thank you again. I agree. Completely agree. That's a good point. Uh, okay, back to our host, Randy Simpson. Um, again, I think there's some chat um, comments that have come in from council members or others. I'm not, again, able to see that. Maybe I can stop uh, sharing my screen and um, see if that gets me back into the main um, section here. So, okay, very good. All right, um, thank you everyone for your participation tonight. It's been very helpful. I've appreciated the insights. Uh, been, been provided and it gives us some opportunities to consider um, other rules and regulations that we've not considered yet that's very helpful. Um, again, if you have additional ones, you're always welcome to provide those uh, in the future at the email address. And with that, uh, Randy, we will, um, um, I do see one hand still raised on uh, call on user number nine. I think it was earlier. I think they just didn't take their hand down. Okay, all right, uh, very good. Uh, so thank you everyone for your participation tonight. Um, again, you're welcome to participate also on July 28th if you like. Uh, the material presented will be the same at that time, um, but questions may be different and you may gain additional insight uh, through our conversations on that time. In the meantime, please uh, review the oil and gas manual at the website and also provide written comments at the email address oilandgas.org. Thank you very much everyone. Have a good night.